Hello everybody, welcome back. This is going to be a little bit of a shorter video. It's going to be kind of more unscripted, more of a rant. I'm working on a longer video for you guys that should be out sometime later this week, but I didn't want to just not upload for most of the week. So today we're going to talk about this new survey that came out from YouGov asking people in Britain what they would do if a world war broke out and how they would respond to being drafted or conscripted into the military. So this report came out today and it's from data collected between January 26th and February 21st of this year. And they sampled 4,167 people and the answers are really not at all surprising. Um, Britain, just like most of the Western world, is facing a conscription crisis, a crisis of people wanting to join the military. And so let's let's break down the responses that people gave. So the question was, if a new world war broke out, which of the following would you do? Uh, I would volunteer for military service. We're just going to we're just going to look at the uh, 18 to 40 year olds, um, because it's really kind of your main fighting force. A, a lot of the boomers might say, oh, yeah, I would I would join. But like they don't want them and they can't. So you know, your 18 to 20, 40 year olds, only 9% said that they would be willing to volunteer for military service. 22 said they wouldn't volunteer, but if they were conscripted, they would serve. But a whopping 37% said that they would refuse to serve if called up. And now, again, that's not really surprising. Um, the numbers are broken down more. 16%, I don't know. Um, and 16%, um, I don't believe in armed forces would want me. So maybe people who are disabled or um, and otherwise not willing to, or not capable of military service. So yeah, that's not super surprising. What's interesting is that when they reframe the question and they turn it into, if a new world war broke out and the UK was under imminent threat of invasion, which of the following would you do? And it's the same, you know, the same responses. It doesn't really move the needle that much. It, it moves it a little bit. So you jump from 9% saying they would volunteer to 13%, 22% um, saying they would respond if they were called up, 22% you know, up to 23%. Um, I would not volunteer and would refuse to serve if called upon. Still 32%, only you know a drop from 37%. So you're really not seeing like a, a significant increase in the number of people that would be willing to serve even if Britain was under imminent threat of invasion. Now that should tell you something. That should be setting off alarm bells in the UK. And I, I think that it is. They've been talking about implementing conscription again. Um, their military is pretty weak. I think recently the US downgraded them from a, a great power. Or we had some kind of metric as them being like a top tier military. They got bumped down recently their navy's not anywhere near what it used to be so they're really not in any shape to fight a war especially a war that was on their own soil um, not that russia would actually do that what's really interesting and although not very surprising is the responses that people gave to the i will not serve if called up their reasons why and so these are broken down as well so the most common answer, 21%, was I'm not ready or prepared to fight for the rich and powerful. So this idea that people in charge, the rich, they're starting these wars, uh, you know, they don't have anything to do with me, I'm not going to get any benefit out of it. That's 21%, so nearly a quarter. 18%, um, I don't believe in war against war in general. So maybe you're pacifists or people that just don't think that war solves anything i would be bad at it 11 percent 11 percent. i don't want to die i'm scared you know that's a, a fair reason for not wanting to necessarily join the war and then this is the one that's interesting and has some of the most interesting responses um not prepared to fight for this country not patriotic or nationalistic that's six percent um and then it, it keeps on going down all, all sorts of different reasons i have I have dependents, I'm, I'm too old, uh, I'm not from the UK, um, small percentage, so, but yeah, it's only 6% of respondents that said um, I'm not patriotic or nationalistic, but I have a suspicion that a lot of people who gave other answers 
probably are feeling very similar. Maybe they didn't want to just come out and say it. Um, because in Britain, you're not really allowed to be nationalistic when you're not really allowed to have um, negative views about like the state of the nation, right? A lot of the things that the British have been doing lately that may not convince or, or compel somebody to want to fight and die for it. So let's uh, read some of those responses. Okay, so these are some of the responses from the 21% of people that said they weren't willing to die for the rich and powerful. Uh, I won't put myself in danger to defend the interests of people who would not risk themselves for me. Because this government and country don't care about me at any other point in time, they are the most corrupt government in generations and I won't serve them. Uh, my life is more valuable than being wasted in a war caused by rich people's greed because the process would be an unfair process and the expectations would be on the working lower middle classes to serve, not the rich, royalty, or the politicians making the decisions. Why should the youth fight the wars that the elderly politicians have created? I refuse to leave my son and family behind. So those are all pretty common answers. Um, you've, there's themes of that all the, going all the way back to World War I. If you read like All Quiet on the Western Front, the, the character Kaczynski is like, you know, all we, all we just should put uh, all the politicians in a boxing ring and have them duke it out. Like, why are we serving them, right? So these are not uncommon sentiments really anywhere in the world. Um, certainly, like, 21% of people who said they won't serve saying this is the reason, that's that's telling. But I'm, what's really interesting is that uh, 6 or 7% that said they're not patriotic. I'm not patriotic and won't risk my life for this country. I'm not willing to go to war for this country. Don't feel a sense of patriotism or pride to live here. I don't owe my life to my country. The UK, and this is the most interesting one. The UK has seen people like myself as a danger to society. I have no nationalistic pride to protect my country. If my country treated me like an equal, not a minority, I would be willing to serve. Because our borders are already allowing in thousands of men from countries who hate it, or who hate us anyway, so we've already lost before we began. I wouldn't hate, I wouldn't fight for a country that hates its native people. They don't care about the natives, insult the natives, put the natives on a scrape head, then want to use us as cannon fodder for their borderless economic zone. I can't call it a country anymore. Well, forget it. <laughs> Are any of these responses a surprise from Britain? country that's been demonizing native Britons for decades now, the 1984 totalitarian hellscape that is the butt of many, many jokes all of, on the internet all over the world. Oh, yeah, yeah, you got a license for that? Oh, you better bid that knife, bruv. Like, come on, you really... They really didn't see this coming. Like, they didn't think that maybe by marginalizing people and treating them like serfs treating them like second-class citizens in their own country stripping them of all their rights humiliating them constantly that maybe they wouldn't then be willing to just jump into the trenches to fight for the interests of the rich people of the people who imported all these immigrants the people who made all these hate speech laws i just don't understand what any western country has been thinking i don't know if it's that they thought that we had moved beyond war that the United States was so powerful that it didn't really matter how you treated your population, that the U.S. would always foot the bill for military conflict, or that no country would ever be able to start any kind of problems so you could implement these globalist policies. Like, you marginalized the, the white men in these white countries. Those are the people who are going to do all the fighting and dying. And you've created a country and a system that marginalizes them, undermines them, you know, takes every benefit that they could have away from them, elevates people not from there, and then you wonder why they don't want to fight. I mean, it's, it's just breaking the basic social contract between the people and the government. The government provides collective security, you know, common defense, a judicial system that is supposed to be impartial, that people can trust, so they're willing to allow that to arbitrate their disputes rather than fighting each other using physical violence to get their way and you basically stripped all that undermined all that you've turned the courts on the people you use them to target people for hate speech you know britain in 2016 britain imprisoned 3300 people for 
things that they posted online, hate speech, things like that. Russia, you know, big bad authoritarian Russia in the same year, only imprisoned 400, right? So how can you say that Russia is this authoritarian nightmare when Britain imprisons more people for speaking online than Russia does? Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say that that's the only reason that a lot of these people aren't willing to fight. I think it's certainly a big reason. You've basically destroyed any ability for like native Britons, like the men to have a good quality of life. They're mostly single. You know, there's a huge drug epidemics. Um, they're never gonna be able to afford homes. So they already don't have ownership in the country. So that certainly doesn't help. But, you know, beyond that, um, you've spent generations teaching people that the highest moral good is to be a part of like social activist movements and that really your own feelings of self-worth, your own life is really the most important thing. Um, your feelings, your feeling of acceptance, right? So you like you, 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 you are the most important thing. The, the individual is the basic unit of this country. Well, then it's of course nobody wants to like do something collectivist, like go fight in a war go die for their country because they haven't been brought up like that look what you had to do in world war one world war two in order to get these boys to sit in trenches to you know, spend four years of their lives suffering in muddy horrible awful conditions i mean it was years of schooling patriotism nationalism masculinity you know and then also demonizing the other right the hun the german they're going to destroy the world um it takes a lot of effort to kind of convince a person to lay down their life for the collective because our natural instinct is to seek our own protection, seek our own well-being. And related to that is the fact that mass media has made it so easy to see like what really goes on in war for forever. All you would ever hear about the war is from the newspapers and eventually from television. Even going back to Vietnam, they were showing footage from the war. Um, and not nearly as graphic as today, but it did a lot. It shocked the country and it did a lot to changing the popular consciousness against the Vietnam War. And today it's, it's even worse. I mean, you can go on any Telegram channel. You can go on 4chan, even Reddit, um, Instagram, if they don't take it down, X, right? You can see what's going on on the front line. You have 4K HD video drone footage, people's cell phones, of what really happens when you get shot. You know, what really happens when you step on a landmine, when you get run over by a tank. I mean, I've seen a lot of the footage. I've seen a Ukrainian soldier kneel on a landmine and have his entire leg blown off, hanging on just by the string of his pants, is the only thing keeping his leg from falling all the way off. And he had desperately pulling out a tourniquet, putting it on his leg, you know, trying to stop the bleeding and then crawling, leaving a huge blood trail along the back of an APC that he just jumped out of. You know, and the whole time he's screaming. Th that's the reality of war. And people can see it now in 4K HD. They can hear the screams. And I don't think that they're interested. I think that they're, they're, they, there's no way to dupe the population. There's no way to spin it as heroic, virtuous, to go and fight and die for your country. That's something that authors have been trying to convince people for, again, hundreds of years. All quiet on the Western Front, again, big, you know, one of the most premier examples. He tries to illustrate this gruesome, graphic, horrible picture of what war really is. And this war is more similar to World War I than World War II. You know, the, the grinding artillery, the trenches, the, the infantry combat. And so people are just terrified. They don't want to participate. And I don't blame them. It looks horrible. It really looks awful. And my heart goes out to, to all the people in Ukraine, Russia, that, that are fighting this war you know, on either side, because it is it looks like hell on earth. It really looks like the worst thing that could possibly happen to a human being. All right, so to finish this off, if I were the UK government, if you were the UK government, what, what could you do to try to convince people that they should sign up for the military, that they should be willing to go fight? You know, how would you convince people to sign up for the military? 
to go to war with Russia or Iran or, or whoever it is that NATO inevitably ends up in conflict with. Um, well, so first off, you'd have to do some kind of censorship. You got to get that stuff out of the eyes of the people, the, the gruesome, the brutality of war. You, you got to do something about that because people are seeing that from a very young age. They know the reality. They know what's really happening. And so I, it, it's impossible for them to get it out of their mind. So I think you would have to go on some kind of censorship campaign, I think, if you wanted to, to attract people. And beyond that, you need to get people ownership. You know, if, if you're a young man and you don't have a girlfriend, you don't have a wife, you don't have a home, or you can't afford a house, you're kind of broke, you know, like what, what kind of stake do you have in society? Why should you fight and die to preserve society? You may as well just let the Russians come and maybe they'll treat you better. Things probably can't be much worse. You know, you'd probably be less likely to be arrested for posting on Twitter if the Russians were in charge than the, the British, right? So you need to give them some ownership. Now, I'm not naive, though. I know there's no way that they're going to do that. What you will most likely see in Britain and other countries, if there is a war and they need to get people involved, is chastising, um, humiliation campaigns, right? Like World War One, the white feather movement, where the, the women would put white feathers in men's coats or hats or whatever if they weren't in uniform, right? If they hadn't signed up for the military. I don't think that's going to work this time. Again, you've spent decades trying to demoralize and humiliate these people. I'm not sure that another campaign is going to really go very far to convince them. Oh, yeah, actually, I, I should go and sign up and fight for my country. Also, with like how broken the relationship between men and women is, I don't think that young men really care what women think on the whole. I don't think that they're going to allow some thoughts putting white feathers in their coat to really influence them to go and fight and die in the trenches in eastern europe i just i just don't think that that's going to happen so that probably won't work then you'll see things like asset seizure um and imprisonment threats of violence things like that that's probably going to be most of it right because of course they're not going to give you anything in return for for sacrificing your life right they're not going to give you a home or some property they're not going to fix the immigration system or try to encourage marriage so that you can have a wife and children have some legacy to leave and to to work for of course not they're just going to try to shame you and, and coerce you into doing it now i know i picked on britain for this video um that's just who the article is about um but i think this really is going to be reflectant in basically every single Western country. I'm sure you're going to see basically the same thing in the United States, France, Italy, Spain, Germany, especially. Um, I think you're going to see pretty much the same sentiment. And if they do decide to go to war, if, if NATO does decide to drag us to war with Russia, um, it's going to take a pretty coordinated and Herculean effort on the part of all of us to prevent that from happening, to prevent mass conscription, um, to prevent ourselves from having to go. Um, you may very well end up in jail and, you know, this is something that you may just have to, to get ready for, prepare for. It's something that I'm certainly, you know, thinking about and trying to prepare myself for if it happens because, you know, I'm certainly not going to go fight and die for gay marriage in Ukraine, right? Like that's not my my uh, idea of a good life. So, you know, if you end up in jail, that yeah, sucks. That's that's really sucks. But you know, every time that happens, every time there's draft dodgers, deserters, whatever, they get let out after the war. World War Two, World War One, Vietnam. You know, so you spend a couple of years in prison. Maybe there'll be special prisons for people who are deserters. So. At least they might be of people of similar mind. You can hang out, have fun for a couple years, and then uh, then hopefully you get let out uh, once NATO loses the war, probably. Um, if I'm being realistic, if the United States isn't involved, if this is a European conflict, they're not going to win. There's no way that they win. Um, with the US involved, that becomes more difficult. Uh, Russia does have a better industrial base. We probably have more people to start out with, but it's a defensive war. They have home field advantage. We have to ship everything all the way over there. We're the ones who have to deal with the manpower issues and how do we get people? So it, it certainly wouldn't be a steamroll, but yeah, it, it's it's no matter what, like it's a disaster. Um, it's not a policy that we should be pursuing. 
Um, and I, uh, I hope and I pray that maybe we can get some sensible leaders in in the next year and that maybe we can avoid uh, ever escalating conflict with Russia and Iran and really anywhere in the world. So that's all I have. Uh, like I said, I will get a longer video out later this week. Um, this one's actually already kind of long, but um, more in-depth, more research, less ranty and rambly. So if you enjoyed this video, uh, feel free to give it a like and subscribe. Um, but other than that, I will catch you guys on the next one.